Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with chess players, personalities, authors, and adult improvers about their lives, their careers, and about chess improvement. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Happy 2020, everyone. We have a return guest this week. 2020 will be the year of the next candidates for the next world championship, the year of the next world championship, and the year of Jan Gustafsson. He is a Chess 24 presenter, as you guys know, renowned opening expert, not so secretly has been a member of Team Magnus, and now he is a chessable course author, also a Thailand proponent, and he is joining us now on brand live from Thailand. How are you, Jan? I'm good, Ben. Good to be back. How are you doing? Good. We're ahead of schedule. Usually I bug you around February, but you volunteered early. Um, do, I'm sure, had nothing to do with the fact that you have a course to sell. Um, but obviously, I snap called when you when you suggested that you were ready to come on and um and share your your wisdom and your witticisms. No, I'm planning to plug my chessable course for the next 60 minutes. <laughs> okay, let's do it. So I thought maybe we should play a blindfold chess game. I'll go first. E4, where do you move? C6. <laughs> You're not so good at this plugging thing. Yeah, that's what they keep telling me. <laughs> Got to promote stuff. And no, we're talking about the course. It's an E4, E5 complete repertoire for black and i'm getting some heat because i played e4 c6 in my last bundesliga game and yeah people aren't happy that i'm not preaching where i pray yeah is that yeah. how you say it uh Practice, practicing what you, practicing preach, preaching what you, you preach. preach preaching where i pray what does that even mean sorry <laughs> i'm a foreigner no you're normally your idiom game is strong in english but um <laughs> that's funny i looked at your bundesliga games and i wanted to talk about them was that the one where you drew a 2200 not to uh bring up um you know bad memories yeah that happens a lot to me so i'm kind of used to it i'm not proud of it uh, but i'm really bleeding rating in these black games in in bundesliga i mean if you don't play your lifetime repertoire what do you expect <laughs> <laughs> that is a good point no, no the sorry, you thing, go ahead. though with it <laughs> is if you publish your repertoire and I'm trying not to like keep any secrets when I publish these things, then it becomes a little risky to play it because especially against a much lower rated opponent, if you do an objective black repertoire, there will be spots where you're trying to equalize. And if you just follow your lines and they end with sort of a peaceful outcome, then it's sometimes a bit tricky to go there because you don't know how much they've seen of your stuff and obviously i play e4 e5 in like 80 percent of my games also against weaker rate opponents and usually then if i smell something's up i will deviate along the way but it's always a bit of a guessing game which comes with the territory of yeah being whatever i do broadcaster and doing these video series that i sort of publish my knowledge well, because i'm world famous i'm always assuming everyone's watching everything i say yeah i mean everyone's got a uh, alert set up for when your course comes out so <laughs> yeah sure <laughs> But um, but I, it actually is understandable when you put it like that. Um, so I, I wanted to, and first of all, full disclosure, we have to say you had a beautiful win in the Bundesliga. Was it the round before that? Yeah, that was the big match for us because we faced Zulingen. I'm on Baden-Baden, which is sort of this super team. You could call it the, what's a good comparison for you Americans? You can do football. The, Everyone <clears throat> follows soccer 15, these days. 15 till 18 Golden State Warriors right. of the, of German chess. So on my team, we have Caruana, Vichy, Svidler, <clears throat> Aronian, Maxim Vachela, Graf, and so on and so forth. I'm just the, for the record, German on list number 16. But yeah, we played our biggest rivals, at least the last couple of years, of the team of Solingen, who won the title, I think, three years ago. And we've had difficulty with them in the past. So that was a big match. And yeah, we were happy to win that one, and I was happy to win that. But then on the next day, you could see we were maybe a little too happy. And we were huge favorites. We did win the next match, but there were a couple draws or even one loss, I think. I think Shirov lost. That cost all of us quite a bit of rating collectively. Yeah, so you're eighth board, so you're like Maurice Spates or something? Nah, nah. I I pass. 
You pass? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good point. He does not pass. But in terms of the role, yeah, it's crazy to me that you play eighth board um, on that team. Yeah, and you you had that nice win. But I did, I actually, of course, I'm more interested in the game you drew. Um, and, and we'll link to it. And of course, we won't go deep into the variations because that's the worst form of podcast. But um, you, it was a dynamic position. You seem to be worse. But to my feeble mind, it looked like there was a lot of play. So what what was the consideration behind the the draw agreement? Yeah, that's another tricky game, which I'm not proud of. And frankly, I'm a proponent of the Sofia rules. I think if you don't have to think about it, it's better. But I do think I'm decent at, well, it sounds, ugh, it sounds horrible, decent at bailing out at the right moment if I feel things are really going wrong. It's also because I'm a bit of a pessimist. So if you were talking like, EV or in a position you could always make a case or whatever I'm 300 points I rated or whatever it is that should continue at all costs but in that particular moment in that structure and the final position there are really no plans for me left once he gets his knight to d3 it controls the whole board I can't touch him on the queen side since my pawn is on a4 um, so it's that's just absolutely nothing to do and also sometimes during the game I know my opponent's rating was whatever it was 2250 you can tell that he's actually a decent player, or maybe I gave him was the he? position he's decent in. But he actually played on a very good level, I thought. So I did not see any hope for winning that one. While you can get in trouble there, because White has plans and Black really doesn't. And was he a young person, older person, older gentleman? I can't tell anymore. At my age, everyone <laughs> is a young person to me. That's okay. why I like going to Thailand with all these German retirees around me. I feel young again. I feel nice. like... <laughs> little kid here but no he was probably i don't know 19 20 okay. everyone's young yeah so you got to be a little careful for sure um all right i mean yeah and for the record of course i'm just a, an engine monkey i look at the game and see minus one and a half so um it uh you were vindicated by what the engine said <laughs> well, in terms of um bailing at that moment uh, the final position I'm lost, I didn't check. Yeah, I mean, that's what it says. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. No, it felt, it felt very bad, yeah. yeah Which is also... You go ahead. No, it comes a bit with the territory that that risk is somehow not real because my draw offer will still get accepted like 94% of the time, I would say. <laughs> it's just so tempting, and he had offered me a draw earlier. So this risk of losing, I never really feel, and that's why before you take some decisions which I know are shady, but I thought keep the game going to some extent. But as you can see by my results, especially with black in Bundesliga, it's really not an art form I've mastered being black against 22, 23 hundreds. While my results with white, I think are pretty good. And with white also against grandmasters, I still have a great score, even though I'm not very active. But this black games against guys much lower rated is a spot where I lose a lot of rating. Huh. But the team is uh, the team is doing well. I mean, it's early in the season, right? Team is doing pretty well. Yeah, we've won all our matches. Our main rivals have already lost some matches, so looking pretty good. Okay, um, and that bring and so spe- I had mentioned that I, of course, am a slave to in the engine. And you mentioned I did purchase your course. I was f- for you know we've been friends for a long time. Finally, I was able to purchase something of yours. Um, so, uh, glad to support the cause. And, um, I noticed right away, you said in the intro that you, that your girl, Lila Zero taught you some things in, in this, uh, lifetime repertoire. I'm so confused. Zoo. You call her my girl, my boy, my helper. Like these are sensitive times. So I don't know. That's but a good point. Lila Zero has, uh, yeah, really revolutionized checking openings. I think the, the word is out. So it's not really a secret anymore. But for, yeah, I would say more or less 10 years, we were all using the same machines that giving us similar zero zeros and the same moves. It was first, what was it? First Ripka, then Houdini, then Stockfish. Sorry, sorry if I'm forgetting some, but those were the machines that everybody used more or less at a high level. And there was some fatigue because you, you kept getting the same moves and they were very happy to give zero zeros everywhere. Well, Lila is really giving you different ideas and also different evaluations he's more opinionated because of the way it's programmed but mainly he just has a great feel for openings like it's or he or she whatever it and so it's really i think re 
reinvigorated people checking openings. They were getting a bit tired of going over the same zero zeros all over again. And it's made yeah chess analysis fun again because it's really very different from Stockfish, which shout out to my boy Stockfish is still a very, very useful weapon. And I think Stockfish in many positions is still superior to Leela because he's a bit better calculator. But there you have two guys or girls that are quite different from themselves from from each other now really has made yeah chess analysis more fun and for the repertoire in a way it's frustrating because i had to sort of start from scratch and recheck everything because obviously over the years i've accumulated a lot of e4 e5 notes but it's also fascinating that you get so much new input and positions in the marshal which i've been checking literally for 20 years where i thought i knew everything and it gives you a new move very early on and it's interesting so it's been fun and yeah i think lila zero is a tremendously valuable tool huh i mean that that must yeah that must be really cool. I feel like there's probably going to be an explosion of um, of opening stuff. I mean, I, I've just in for me in recent weeks, just having interviewed uh, Christoph Zalecki, your your fierce competition for what to play against E4 with his uh, you know, his play like Magnus course and uh, right 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 and Larry Kaufman noted uh, computer wizard. Um, there's it's a uh, it's. And I just talked to David Vigorito yesterday, which will proceed, he'll proceed you. He just wrote a book about the Nidorf. I mean, I feel like it's it's so hard to pick, and the uh, the theory is just going to explode. So, um, how long do you think this will last before like everything's internalized, or are the engines? Is it just going to be like like are we nearing peak engine, or are they just going to keep getting even better, and y- you'll have to incorporate even more stuff? You never know, because for me, it always feels with every new engine, these are our overlords, and this is the the final word. Like, when Ripka came out, it was the first time where we felt, okay, we can just trust Ripka, and that's, I don't know, when it was like 2008, 2007, somewhere. Before, with the older engines, you always had a feeling, okay, maybe I can overrule this guy, or I can find something. But for humans, it's become very tough for like 12 years already to overrule the engine that's why it's hard for me to judge like how far progress will go or if there is a natural ending point to it but it's also why i'm so fascinated and i think people were very fascinated with this alpha zero really showing us a new way how chess could be played at that level and now for analysis lila zero is similar but where it's gonna go i have no clue i don't think theory will expand like we've been checking lots of stuff for a long time now, but it's changing in many places early on, which I think is good for chess because it shows that chess is still alive after all these years of c- computer analysis. Yeah, that's true. Um, so in within your course, you mentioned that you discovered a lot of new things in the Marshall, which, of course, you're you're renowned for, for your, your knowledge of the theory to begin with. But um, overall, what what Leela discovery surprised you the most in, in terms of uh, and as we were talking before we recorded before we hit record, this is um huge undertaking your course. I mean, it's just so much stuff. So what what uh, what didn't you expect that uh, that Leela uncovered? It's hard for me to say because I always have two engines running and I yeah, check all the moves with Stockfish and Leela. I do recall that in some of these old mainline marshals, which I mainly gave, frankly, theory is fine there anyway. And that's when white takes the pawn on e5 and then goes d4, bishop d6, rook e1, queen h4, g3, queen h3. I'm sure everybody will know what I'm talking about. And then white is a couple moves where I thought theory was fine already, and it is, but Leela just gives so many new options. For example, bishop e3 on move 15. Sorry, guys, I'll stop with it. <laughs> going deep in it. I'm actually where with you. <laughs> everyone's assumed that yeah, bishop g4 is the only sensible move for ages, and now Leela shows you a move like rook a7, and it says bishop e6 is fine in many, many positions in the marshal, where you're supposed to give checkmate on the king side. It quietly goes a5, likes to push its it's flank pawns and tries to gain space on the queen side and says that is okay. So it's really just, it's not so much individual moves, but his way of yeah, seeing the game, seeing the whole board is quite impressive. And yeah, it's, it led to a lot of stuff. Like I could make a list probably. The thing is, I don't really think in novelties because if you generate these files or these courses, it's more about yeah, giving sort of the truth or what you think is the truth at that time with with the tools you have. 
So I don't really keep track of, oh my god, this is a Lila novelty, or no, this has been played by so-and-so, or this has been suggested by that. But in the process of yeah, producing good lines, it's a tremendous help. Hmm. <laughs> and Jan, I don't know if you saw, I'm guessing you're not, uh, you're not um, searching chess Reddit that often, but the shots you fired at the King's Gambit, I know it's not the first time you fired shots at the King's Gambit, but <laughs> you made a list of moves that are better on move two. And it, it led to uh, quite a chess Reddit thread. Were you aware of uh, of this discussion? No, I haven't seen that, but I'm aware it's a dangerous can of worms I'm <laughs> opening. And well, why don't you start? For, I'm, for I'm listeners used to who didn't the feedback <laughs> like, uh, well, what? basically, e4, so, e5. White can go f4, which loses I think a pawn. Most en- most good engines will tell you e takes f4 and something around minus 0. 050 to minus 0. 060, something like that. So I actually checked our curiosity with Leela where 2f4 would rank on his list of preferred moves after e4, e5. And I think it was 22nd or 23rd, <laughs> so I gave the list of moves that came before that, you know, h4, queen f3, bishop d3, queen g4, queen h5, stuff like that. And I'm aware I'm not making any friends. I understand the King's Gambit has a loyal following. And I also get often get feedback like, oh, you haven't mentioned that move from this article published somewhere about the King's Gambit. And the truth is, I, I haven't seen any of these things because I do not consider it a good opening. So I don't spend much time on it. And it's reasonably easy, I think, for any but he was good at working with engines of, yeah, like making all these lines work for black. One one source, I haven't used so many sources, but one book that helped me was Ivan Salgado had come to the same conclusion. He's a friend of mine, a Spanish grandmaster, and he had written a little, I think, a Kindle ebook called The End of the King's Gambit, question mark. This was pre-Lila times, but he had already pretty much refuted it, so a lot was confirming but I do apologize if I did not see the move, whatever it is, five bishop e two that was given in some book. There, I'm reasonably confident that I could, yeah, shoot these all down if you give me 50 minutes and and two engines. The problem is after e4 e5, there's many real problems. The Italian is a really nasty opening. The Spanish, it's not just the marshal. All the sidelines are dangerous. So to spend too much time on the king's gambit as an e4 e5 player is counterproductive and still I'm sure it's going to come back to to haunt me but I'd be thrilled if anybody played E4 E5 F4 against me I promise I haven't seen any of the books or articles we've written, okay. written on <laughs> all right but willing to take your chances yeah and you don't you don't see it uh you don't see it uh basically ever um at the 2600 plus no, and level for for good reason it's just not a logical thing you give a pawn on the second move you weaken your king and you don't gain whatever the common wisdom is the three tempi in return once again it has a rich history nothing but respect for the old masters that uh, that played it and i'm sure murphy would crush me tomorrow with the king's gambit if i didn't have my my computer analysis for it but it's just not a good opening that makes sense okay Um, anyway i'm I'm unhappy about the segment because now there's going to be more scrutiny on my King's Gambit chapter, and someone will tell me, no, here, White can actually draw. And that's a discussion. I'm not 100% sure if after E4, F, E5, F4, Black is winning, or if White can still draw. My money would be on White can probably still draw, but it's very close. But that I'd be curious to find out once the aliens solve chess. Huh, wow. That's, yeah, that's not a good place to start, though. Um, no, no, exactly. Um, so, were there any, I mean, uh, this is a, uh, do you happen to remember looking at what Leela said in terms of second moves? Like, were were any surprising? Like, uh, I mean, this sounds ridiculous, but H four, you know, being that these um, neural networks love Harry the H pawn, um, like, was it what we would expect in terms of knight F three being the best, and uh, I guess bishop C four after that, and knight C three? Was there any uh, surprises? Yeah, after E four E five, knight F three is so clearly the best move. Like, you develop the knight, you attack the pawn on E five. You get closer to castling. It's not a debate. Like sometimes you will see strong players play two bishops c4, and for a very specific reason is that they want to avoid the Petrov, which I can relate to <laughs> because the Petrov is pretty tough to crack, as we know. So sometimes they will play two bishops c4, knight f6, d3, and then after knight c6, knight f3 transpose back to the Italian. 
but everybody else will and should play two knight f3. So, well, I've covered everything. Two knights, c3, bishop c4, d4, f4, g3, whatever. I do not think it's very close when it comes to the second move. And I think the engines agree with me that knight f3, whatever. They will say 0, 30 and everybody, everything else will already be close to, much closer to 0. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on this, but I think it's, it should be somewhere on there. Okay. Um, and I've got some questions for you that are tangentially related to, of course, Chess24 um, and Chessable. Have, um, they're joined at the hip now. I don't know what the business terminology would be, but uh, Magnus Carlsen's company um, basically bought them both, um, as a lot of listeners will already be aware. So we have some questions related to that, but is there anything we need to say to further show your course before we uh, move on from here, Jan? I don't know. Like, I'm not very comfortable with self-promotion. I, I worked on it, and I think it's a good repertoire for black players that are interested in having a good reply to 1e4. But everyone should, yeah, judge for himself. Is it something for them? Yeah, and obviously Jan's reputation speaks for itself in the chess world. I'm uh, working for Team Magnus. Uh, con- we're going to get to this later, but secretly consulted in other world championship matches. Um, now his spot has been blown up, as they say. So, um, yeah, we'll we'll be talking about that as well. But Jan, you know, sometimes he's funny, so I forget that he's actually knows knows his stuff. But both can be true. So recommend the course. I checked it out. It's um unbelievable amount of stuff, like un- unbelievable amount of lines. So really is a lifetime repertoire. Um, and obviously Jan stays on top of this stuff. So I'm sure that. While Jan might not be the one inputting the code into uh, Chessable, that over time, any changes that other engines come, um, um, anything major is going to be addressed. So, uh, listeners, check it out. Um, okay, Chess24 and Magnus question from Deshaun Solomon. I have a feeling I know what your answer will be to some of this, but I'm just going to read the three questions. Uh, number one, how many premium members does Chess24 have? Um Let's take them one at a time. So let's I hear it. I don't know. I, and if I knew, I wouldn't say. Okay. I didn't know if it was public, like if people do digging, if they could find something out or not. But I, I knew you would say you didn't know. I don't know, know either, but I, I honestly don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I figured that. Um, at least one, Deshaun, because I'm a premium member. So they got, that, they got that going for them. But um, okay. On to number two. Any planned new video series coming to Chess24 soon? Yeah, the the thing is, I always have plans for like 15 different video series, and then I talk about them, and then people get upset that I don't do them all at a time. Right, so there's, there's always plans. There okay. will be Vikings Day will occupy most of the month of January, where we'll do live coverage. And general, that's always the tricky thing for me, how to balance stuff between doing video series, doing live coverage, doing boring behind-the-scenes stuff. But yeah, I'll certainly keep doing video series on Chess Twenty Four, and I got ideas. Excellent, but not not going to reveal them. And um, you know, I I love Chess Twenty Four, big fan, et cetera, et cetera. But I I was checking out. Of, I mean, I saw your your course with Laurent Fresnet on chess structures, right. and I one thing I, I sometimes can't tell the release date. Is that new or old? No, it's pretty new. I think okay, we good. published it. I don't know, November, early November, somewhere. somewhere okay, there. that's what I thought. Um. Some tiny suggestion for for our friends at Chess Twenty Four. Just put the publication date um, up there. I can usually tell from the comments because if there's like some ancient comments, then I know it's not new. But yeah, so, ah, you, so the publication date is not in there. I, I didn't see it. I mean, not the sharpest I tool mean, in the not, sheds, uh, so I, I may have know. missed it. it. Yeah. Um, but anyway, Deshaun, you can check that out in the meantime. Um, um, fellow uh, super strong player and Team Magnus member Laurent, I I would like to watch that. I like them. I like the macro views of uh, the chess openings and structures. There you go. Um, and question number three from Deshaun is related, which is, what's your next chessable course, if any? I'm not sure. Once again, it's a time thing. I <clears throat> was pretty much out of business doing anything else for more or less two months doing this chessable course. And so, yeah, it was a huge scope, so it's going to be tricky to to find the time. But I enjoyed the process, and we'll, we'll see how this plays out in the future. I wouldn't know, but there's no specific topic on my mind yet. So, yeah, we'll have to see. It's complicated. There's so many balls in the air with this group and what goes where and when and why. But, yeah, 
I'll be working, I promise. Once okay. I make it out of Thailand, if I <laughs> if I ever leave this place, I'll be back to work. Okay, glad to hear it. Yeah, and uh, poor Jan, you know, the ink is barely dry on your lifetime repertoire. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, I work really hard. <laughs> Give me a break, Dishon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But someday, yeah, there, there hopefully will be more. Um, okay. Related question from Greg Smith. Um, thank you for the support, Greg. Greg asks, oh, and I should mention, you know, sometimes I forget to mention like where these questions come from. But when I have a high profile guest such as yourself, Jan, it's important because people who don't always listen will be listening. So for people who support the podcast via Patreon or PayPal, they find out when big shot guests like Jan Gustafsson are coming on and they can send in their questions. So Greg, thank you for the support. And here is the question. Uh, Greg asks, we know that you've worked for Magnus on his team when he prepares for the world championship, but what is the hierarchy in the newly combined chess 24 play, Ma- play Magnus company? Does Magnus defer to you? I am not sure. I believe Magnus could be my boss. He's never given me any orders, but he could be, I'm not hundred percent sure. But I'm fairly sure he won't defer to me. Having said that, <laughs> when I want something, like, uh, and I get in touch regarding banter blitz or commentary or whatever, he's been actually very, very helpful because he's a busy guy, first of all, and he's also the world champion of chess. Like, he doesn't have to talk nonsense with me or doing commentary for a couple hours or play against the users regularly. But he seems really into it. He's playing this banter blitz cup and stuff like that. So he's been great, but I'm pretty sure he doesn't defer to me, and neither should he. He's he's pretty entertaining too. He's he's kind of a natural. Sorry, he's incredibly witty. If he wants to, like, I think he's showing it more and more. He wasn't always like switching it on when he didn't feel like. But no, no, he's very very funny. Did you give him any pointers? No, not at all. Huh? I guess he just learned by watching you. I do not think so. I think. <laughs> He's always been very funny, and he's really into wordplay, which I'm also into. It's maybe not the highest art of comedy, but I really enjoy it. You can see how much pleasure he takes when he pulls something off. So it's, yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, and it's impressive. Also decent at chess, I'm told. Oh, really? Yeah, and it's impressive because you guys are obviously not even English speakers. Um, (laughs) I mean... (laughs) Not even English speakers sounds a bit rough, but yeah, (laughs) point taken. Maybe I'm the one that's not an English. Not to correct your English, <laughs> right? Um, so he's not ordering you to get coffee and and stuff like that when you're streaming from his apartment. Um, I didn't see any coffee maker in there. No, I don't think so. Okay. Even though <clears throat> I've become a big coffee enthusiast, do you drink a lot of coffee? You always sound stressed and tired. You got all these kids. You must be drinking lots oh, of yeah, coffee. Oh yeah, right? I'm a caffeine enthusiast. Is, is flat white becoming a big thing in the States? I know I, I go into cafes and I order flat white, and then if they don't have one, I say, okay, give me a cappuccino. So I'm becoming very, very snobby about coffee. Oh, uh, really? The biggest, I mean, I'm not so on top of it, because again, with the kids, um, I just, as long as it has caffeine, I'm, I, you know, we have our French press, we, you know, we do have some standards, but we're not, um, right. not too on top of it. But cold brew was the big thing here. Cobra, what is that? Uh, it hasn't they, arrived in Europe yet. They, they brew the coffee cold instead of hot. I mean, it takes like more than a day, and it's supposed to, uh, I think, have higher caffeine concentration and taste better. I, of course, haven't brewed it myself, wow. but it does taste good. So something for you to explore. Um, Another thing I'm into, because I know you want to keep going about coffee because your listeners enjoy that, is a thing called Bulletproof Coffee. Have you, have you heard of Bulletproof Coffee? They were doing some... It's, poker ads so i have they've got effective advertisement i i wasn't aware it's a brand it's just it's just you you do your coffee then you add some i think it's called mct oil and butter or almond butter you throw it all in the blender you press the button and it keeps you not only awake but well fed for like five six hours so it's it's another topic i'm trying to okay. i'm very confused about nutrition but bulletproof coffee Check it out. Okay. And when we have you back next year, look forward to hearing more coffee discoveries. I just looked up the flat white for anyone wondering. It's a it's a coffee drink consisting of espresso with microfoam. Um, but <laughs> you know, before before we have no listeners left, we better get back to at least things tangentially related to chess. Um, which important tang- coffee is very related. <laughs> That's true. For definitely- how much you drink before the game, how you time it. Yeah. Very important topic. No, I anyway. agree. 
Um, you, I asked you online, and you kind of uh, you you didn't want to take credit for Magnus's uh, fantasy soccer success. No, also, I'm I like Magnus, and I've been honored to be on his team twice. But we're not exactly daily in touch about his non-chess exploits. So you know, I love to take credit, even when it's not due. But <laughs> I know absolutely nothing about his fantasy. So you're not in the Grandmaster exploits. League that was mentioned in like the Telegraph article. You're not. You're not I, one of the I, members. I don't like soccer. I'm, as you know, I'm very busy doing what's this? What's it called appropriating your culture. Yes. So I only follow basketball and U.S. stand-up comedy and stuff like that. I, I even call it soccer, even though in Europe that's a total crime. But I'm I'm not following the Premier League or. I think they're all doing this Premier League thing, right? This English League thing. Yeah, yeah. I I couldn't name two players on a team. I know zero. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm there with you. I was just curious. I mean, I'm pretty sure Peter Hein Nielsen's in his league, but I don't know who else beyond that. Yeah, yeah. Think. Peter's in there. Laurent's in there. Maxime is probably in there. No, a bunch of grandmasters, but yeah, I'm not sure who does well. Except obviously, I read the stories about Magnus. Right, which tremendous is, success. It's just funny, yeah, and can't can't hurt the chest. Well, I don't know. Probably good for the chest brand. Um, all right. Uh, I think it is, yeah. yeah, I mean, it continues to make him look smart. You know, no, no surprise there. Um, all right. So, Speaking young. of look smart. Yes. Um, I think he might be smart. This is a topic I've been thinking. No, obviously he's smart. That, I'm, that part I'm joking about. But a topic I've been seriously thinking about recently is we might have had this discussion. I'm not sure if on air, but in the past. But I used to believe that talent is overrated and yes, it's yes, about we putting did. in the hours and so on. And I'm no longer sure. If you look at guys like Magnus, also I've been listening to some new science podcasts and so on. Talent might be a thing after all. Because how do you explain Carlson, Swidler, and these guys? Like, <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. I'm, not sure. I disagree- I'm very I disagree- confused about it. <laughs> I disagreed with you the whole I re- time. Remember you disagreed back then. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but I, mean, I thought that's just because you were a lazy chess player who only got to twenty two hundred. So you had to blame it on talent, <laughs> right? But <laughs> no, I, 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 yeah, I'm very confused about the topic. Yeah, no, I, I experienced the limits of my, uh, my abilities. So that, that's how I knew. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it is an interesting topic. But I mean, just watching the Magnus documentary, it's clear the guy uh, is not your run of the mill, um, you know, um, chess mind. Um, yeah, I don't know. I didn't like that documentary. I don't think Magnus has seen it, but yeah, to me it was. I understand why it was a success, and obviously you got to tell a story, but I feel it wow. was a bit overblown with the the genius part, how he sees these lines and the connections in the book and so on. Huh. So I didn't really buy into that, well, so what that else, narrative that much. What else didn't you like about it, just out of curiosity? Um... I should say I didn't like is a bit strong. I think the guy, Benjamin Ray, I think is his name, did tremendous work. And yeah, he got a lot of footage and put together a consisting storyline, which was obviously a great hit. And there was a lot of stuff to see. So didn't like is a bit strong. But yeah, this this narrative in there about the kids that didn't have any friends at school. Oh, so right, he had yeah. to focus on chess and so on. And how he could see these connections in his books and... I'm sure he did memorize all these uh, 200 Norwegian districts and so on. But many kids, I was just, I mean, nerd culture is big. Many kids know a lot of stuff about many different things and so on. And yeah, I'm not sure that is that is the story. But okay. <clears throat> obviously, yeah. you need the angle of the genius kid who yeah. was socially awkward and so on. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I was just amazed. I assumed I'm actually a little surprised. I assumed that there was more uh, Carlson family involvement because of the footage. I mean, and for listeners who don't know this, this documentary is available on Netflix. I mean, most of you have probably seen it. It's worth watching for sure. Uh, quibbles notwithstanding. But yeah, I mean, because of all the footage, I assumed that they were, I mean, you know, not editing it, but uh, signed off on it. No, I think they were, I think. Okay. Henrik was heavily involved, or, well, somewhere, somewhere the, Henrik is Magnus' father. Footage must have come from somewhere. I'm sure he signed off on it, too. I'm All I'm saying is I'm not sure if Magnus has seen it, so I've never talked to him about it. I don't know his opinion on it, but okay. that's also pretty normal. Once we have the perpetual chess podcast, 30 for 30, I'm not sure you're going to watch it. Actually, you will watch it, right? <laughs> 
Um, okay, so you're going to have to report back to us on that one, Jan. <laughs> now, uh, next up, uh, I was you read the Anon Files. Yeah, yeah, that was a great book. Yeah, so we just recently talked to the guest, and I, I was impressed, first of all, because you, you like to um, downplay how, mu- how often you read as opposed to Netflix and chill, but you were right on top of this one. Um, I'd read it uh, even before I had, and it hasn't been out for long. And yeah, that was a coincidence because I was at this Bundesliga weekend, which we've talked about, and Vichy was actually on the team. Another teammate of mine, Etienne Bacro, he had a couple of copies with him. So I got a copy, I bought one there from him directly. And I did something I never do. I actually had Vichy sign it. He was happy to sign it, which I'm always, because I'm yeah around these chess superstars, so I usually try not to go too fanboy. But I really like the book, and yeah, I read it. Actually, we talked about my game, which I didn't win against a lower-rated opponent, which was on Sunday morning. And I should blame the Anand Files. Is it called the Anand Files, the Vichy Files? I don't know. The Anand Files. I should blame the book on it, the Anand Files. The book on it, because I read it pretty much in one setting on that Saturday night after I got it. So I didn't prepare very hard for my Sunday morning. But yeah, it's a great book. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, and so... So, listeners, you can now hear. I mean, I I talked up the book when when I interviewed uh, Mikhail Ablin, the the author. But I'm I mean, I'm speaking from the heart. I also had trouble putting it down, and it sounds like you had a, a similar experience. Yeah, for me, it was particularly interesting because I know some of these people quite well. Peter Hein has been a friend of mine forever. I know Calvin Chanov quite well, and also I've been on on these teams in the World Championships. So, not not on these teams, but yeah, twice for Magnuson to compare notes how they were doing things and the theory in it and was also beautifully researched and narrated yeah i really enjoy it i yeah. was a bit surprised actually i'm not sure if you covered this with michiel on the podcast how he got all that amount of information like not what was going on but very detailed opening information and stuff like when we did this interview i think after the magnus match stuff i would never tell you about like how they organized their work yeah exactly how many searches they did at night so that they all got clearance or felt free to talk about it i was very surprised i understand it's 10 years in the past but obviously it was a joy to read and find yeah out what's going on. we did talk about that and you did artfully dodge my related questions i probably didn't didn't do as good a job of recon as mike you but um basically what he said was that he was basically piecing it together by going through the repertoires himself so he would ask very specific questions and then they would feel compelled to respond instead right. of just saying like hey how'd you make the repertoire yeah no that makes sense if you ask somebody listen i move 17 what if bishop c2 obviously that's a more yeah, engaging way. But I was still surprised at the level of detail he managed to get, not just out of Peter Heine, who I think was his main source in the beginning, but also out of Kazim and Wojtaszek and Ganguly. So, yeah, it was impressive work. And yeah, you could tell he spent some time on it. And yeah, highly recommend it. Yeah, and uh, I ch- I told him that I was going to be interviewing you, and he, um, he, he mentioned that he hoped I would ask you... Um, if you guys still worked such ridiculous hours that are detailed in the books um, in in the Magnus match? No, actually, that was the one thing where I'm not sure, like I had heard these stories and not only from the Vichy team, but also from the Kramnik team at that time. It doesn't seem healthy to me. Like, yeah, I was joking around with the guys that according to my math after reading the book peter heine slept a total of like 200 hours from 2008 to <laughs> right. till 2012 and that can't be right like obviously you work a lot if there's something to do but in general for me and now you guys can probably rightfully point out that's why magnus's preparation was so crappy in the matches <laughs> but i would get like let's say five hours i would say if it was a game day And then we would sleep like, yeah, eight hours or something normal before a rest day. So it was never like the stories I read that it was that it was usually two hours of sleep. And no, that we've hardly ever done. Sometimes you're checking something and you lose track of time. And then it's 6 a.m. and you think, okay, I might not get anywhere today, but I still want to finish this file or whatever. So it can happen that you just, as as always, if you're working on something and you got to finish it, but it wasn't a regular 22-hour workday, which reading the book, sometimes it sounded like that okay. during these Vichy matches. 
Uh, yeah, well, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, it does seem like it could be counterproductive at some point. Um, although, what do I know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, some of them say no. Also, they were eating junk food and drinking coffee and not working out and so on. It, it can't be sustainable. Yeah. Also, I read these stories about Kazim always needing half a year to recover after the matches, which, yeah, sounds tough. It's believable with the way they did it. But, wow. Yeah, and of course, I would. The I would old guard, they worked really hard. Yeah, and I wonder as Kasim uh, branched off to head Fabi's team, how much of that culture transferred, and how much he made it more uh, livable for for that team as well. I think they're a bit more laid back over there as well. Like obviously, you work if there's stuff going on and tension is high in the World Championship matches. But yeah, that culture they had sounded a bit extreme to me, excessive to me. Also, they had these I don't know these very long sessions where they're all stuck in Bad Zoden. Shout out to Bad Zoden. I'm sure it's a beautiful place. That's cold and you're there for three months and it sounds like they're, like not during the match, but before that, three months in a row when you're working for 14, 15 hours there every day. It sounded, it sounded superhuman to me and I'm not sure it's, it's the best way, but clearly Vichy had amazing results and everyone, as far as I know, is healthy and well. So shout out to them. But yeah, I was... I was, well, I, I knew this from, well, obviously talking to Peter Heine and Kazim and these guys. I knew these stories, but to see it all in writing, if, yeah, no one's exaggerated anything, it sounded like, how do you do that? And just out of curiosity, I mean, obviously, again, we've both recommended this book, so, um, and nothing I think you say will change that. But was there anything that you didn't think was, was an accurate portrayal that you read from, from your sort of inside knowledge? Um, let me think. I I wouldn't know. Like I was surprised about some things, but I I think they were true. Like nothing sounded made up. But yeah, from I've known Peter Heine for a long time, and it sounded like at some point Ganguly was ten minutes late to whatever a training camp started at ten thirty, and Ganguly arrived at ten forty, and Peter Heine said, "Okay, this is not how we do things here." That sounded a bit out of character to me, like small things like that. Right. Like we we always work a lot, but no one really cares. Okay. If you show up a little later and then work a little later and so on. But maybe it's also a thing that's changed over time and they were just trying to have this strict regime to be sure that work gets done when they were starting out. I wouldn't know. But such small things, I don't question them to be true, but I was just, yeah, that doesn't match the experience I had. So I was, I was surprised about it. Okay, yeah, and the fact that the, the opening analysis that Mikhail uh, included could hold up to your level of scrutiny, I think, speaks speaks well of the book as well. Um, and, of course, I did uh, highlight the note that you were consulted for the Bond match versus Kramnik. Uh, can you confirm or deny this? Um, yeah, that's true. I mean, it's not like... Depends how you define consulting. I vaguely recall that Peter Heineck called me I think, yeah, after Kramnik played the exchange Slav, because at that time, or the years before that, I was always ex- obsessed with the exchange Slav, and I kept preaching to Peter Heine that's a serious opening and should not be taken lightly. So I was mainly bragging, like, see, I told you. <laughs> but Vichy neutralized it easily in that game anyway. I can't recall specifics of what we talked about, if it was that line. I saw, but I had forgotten that, that I, but Peter Heine actually sent me the game recently because I had forgotten that, so I asked him about it that I had played that same line that happened in the game a couple of days earlier randomly oh, on wow. the ICC, I think it was back then. And Peter apparently knew that. Or Jeez. Wow. I don't know. So he asked me some stuff about it, which I had no idea they were monitoring my blitz games. But yeah, um, I think we had like, I don't know, a 10, 15 minute Skype call talking about general nonsense, but I can't recall doing much serious work that was more about impressions. <laughs> Okay. Then it was 10.30, and I said, okay, I'm going to sleep, enjoy the next 10 hours, Peter Arne. You take it from here. <laughs> I, I appreciate your, your candor about um the the whole thing, but the ICC nugget is crazy. That's le- such a level of detail. Yeah, yeah, I was also surprised. Like, I'm, I mean, I've done things like that, and I've seen them done. Like, people have databases of Blitz games and computer games and so on, and yeah, <clears throat> Yeah, but getting it's not... games from online platforms, but that they would have that specific game, and I'm not sure if they had seen it, like creating the file, because exchange stuff is not exactly your number one worry going into the match. But yeah, I was also surprised he was aware of that. Um, yeah, it's crazy. Um, 
And one other question that I that I asked Mikhail that I thought maybe you would be able to shed some light on. Uh, Gary Lane, uh, I am from England, asked um, submitted a question for Mikhail on the Facebook chess co- chess book collectors group about how much energy is expended by one team trying to figure out who's on the other team. You know what I mean? Like who was yeah, helping? Yeah, um, not not as much as you would think, I believe, especially. I think if you could get some information like before the match when you have your training camps, then it's very, very relevant because these things might point at what openings could be prepared. For example, when I was on the team for the first time in 2016 and Magnus played the marshal in the match, there we made very sure that no one or, well, keep the circle as small as possible regarding my involvement and in 20, when was it, 2018? thing was similar with Daniel Duboff because his presence could point towards the Sashnikov. Uh So you don't want these things like leaking in advance. But then during the match, normally the openings are sort of on the table and you know what you're dealing with at some point and you really have other things to do than worrying about who's doing the clicking or advising on the other side. Also Uh with Team Fabi... I think they've been very open about it for a long time. So that it's Kazim Dominguez and Chirilla and Ramirez. And who am I forgetting? I might be forgetting somebody, but he's had the same core team for a long time. And it seemed like that his method was working. So to be paranoid about is helping Super Grandmaster X, this guy or that guy really doesn't get you anywhere. Like if you get some info, obviously you'll think about it. But I don't think much spying or research is done on either side about these things. Okay. Um, good Good to know. Um, all right. I think that our, our annual segment of me grilling you for 20 minutes about uh, about uh, behind-the-scenes championship team stuff is uh, drawing to a close. Finally. <laughs> all right, Jan, just a couple more topics since you're on vacation. I'm just going to monopolize your time. <laughs> Please so, do Last time or two times ago, who knows, we did a big candidates preview. It's a little bit early for that, but do you do you have early right. thoughts on the upcoming candidate cycle? Yeah, the time of recording this, because as you know, in show business, it's all fake. And at this point, I don't actually know if MVL has qualified yet. So that would, of course, be well, the big yeah. information. would be such a heartbreak if he were to miss it by the... Smallest yeah. of margins again yeah. after the same thing Listen, happened. To listeners him. will know when this comes out, so yeah, right, we'll, right, we'll have right. to kind of gloss over. But I guess he's an underdog as of today because it's the Nepo, um, and, and Nepo controls his own destiny basically. Right. Um. So no, let's see who's in there. I believe there's two very clear and obvious favorites, and that's Caruana and Ding Liren, who. Yeah, I would guess are close. I would still, but that's just random guessing. I would still rate Caruana a little more highly when it comes to who's the favorite to win this tournament because of his experience having played the match, having played multiple candidates, having won it before. And so I would still consider him the favorite, but Ding seems to be improving all the time. Had a fantastic 2019 for me, as an opening nerd, he also plays the Marshall, so I can see his work keeps getting better and better in many spots, and often I'm very impressed with both his white and his black. So yeah, Karana and Ding, I believe. Okay. I'm not sure. I'm not a big stats guy, but I think they have at least 70% between them, and oh, I would wow. split up the 30% between the rest. Of course, anything can happen in such a tournament but I do believe those are heavy favorites. Wow. Bold statement. Um, and yeah, I mean, either one, it would be an amazing match. So, uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. And your, your boys fiddler put Grisha third as uh most likely, um, do, do you have an opinion on that? No, that makes sense. But then we get more into guessing territory, like who could win a super tournament. seems like Aronia is not going to be in there. And then if we look at results of super tournaments over the last five years, you won't find many names that are not Carlson, Caruana, or Ding. Ding has won fewer, but he's won the Sinkfield Cup now. That actually won one of these events. Therefore, I believe everyone else's chances are pretty slim. And Grishuk, when he brings his A game, 
when yeah his time trouble doesn't cost him many points. He has a very very high high floor because he's such a deep thinker. He's so smart. His opening preparation is great. He knows everything there is to know about chess. So yeah, I don't argue with putting Grishuk third, but yeah, to me everyone not called Karana or Ding Liren is a big underdog. So there we're really distributing very small percentages. Of course, I'm always rooting for my boy Anish Giri, who also doesn't have a big track record of winning super tournaments, but I know what a strong player he is, how well he will be prepared, how seriously he's taking it. So I'm not sure I might rate him third, but yeah, as I said, I believe these two are ahead of everybody else right now. Yeah, Giri, of course, would be best for chess Twitter. Um, (laughs) That's for sure. (laughs) I don't know. I hear Ding has been firing some zingers. (laughs) That's funny. Um, so, do you know yet if you'll be covering it? I I would guess, but will you be announcing the uh, candidates? I would think so. I don't think our behind-the-scenes planning is done, but yeah, I very much believe I'll be, I'll be covering it. Yeah. Awesome. So, you've got Weekend Z coming up. Candidates, do you know of anything in between? I don't, actually, but that's... I guess I'm to blame for that because I have not yet studied the calendar of 2020 thoroughly. So Vike usually occupies most of January. I think it starts January 10th until 29th, somewhere there. So I'll be doing that with Mr. Swidler. Then the last year's February and March were reasonably empty spots on like the Super Tournament calendar. So maybe there I can meet Deshaun's meets and rec- <laughs> record some video series. I'm not sure yet. But there's there's always stuff. The chess world is so busy, so you got to pick your spots. But obviously, 2020, the even years are always great for chess because you get the candidates, you get the World Championship match, you get the Olympiad. So the even years, there's always even more stuff going on. Like this yeah. year, we had the the Grand Chess Tour, the FIDE Grand Prix, and the regular Super Tournament. But obviously, nothing compares to the candidates and the World Championship match. So yeah. very much looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm super excited for those as well. I have to admit, I get a little fatigue with the the Grand Prix. I mean, the Grand Prix, I just, I don't find the format that intuitive and, you know, got to check out sometime. So it's, uh, yeah, this this time of year, I'm not not, um, as up on the results as I other, as like when stuff like that is coming up. Right, right, right. Yeah, same here. Um, so you mentioned the Anon files. I always have to at least attempt to get some, some book comments out of you. Have you read anything else recently? Any, any opening surprises you've uncovered? Um, or should we just go straight to pop culture? (laughs) No, I keep telling you, I'll tell you if I read a great book, but I don't read chess books very regularly. Actually, you should give me pointers if there's any great books out there. I'll read them, but I need to stumble upon them because... Yeah, the working methods that I have and that most people have, and I'm not saying this is the right way. I think it actually makes sense to get more information from outside sources. But I usually, you fire up your Leela Zero, your your Stockfish, your whatever correspondence de- games database, your computer games database, your humans database, whatever database you have, and you take it from there. You check what the top players have been doing and what the engines are saying. So for openings, I usually feel these books won't help me that much. Then, I, then again, whenever I see one, I think, oh, this is interesting, or I didn't know that, and I should check it out. So as for me, as a stepping stone to actually learn about developments out there, they would be useful. But that's a long-winded answer to say, no, I haven't really read any opening books recently that I could think of. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I would think, I mean, obviously, I, I'm – not sniffing your level, but I would think if nothing else, it might, you know, it's like a shortcut. If you know that they're working with the engine, you can just pick up the book and, um, you know, you might, you might stumble across something that you then turn on the engine yourself and dig deeper. Yeah. yeah. No, no, it certainly makes sense. I just, yeah, I don't follow the market closely enough to know. Gotcha. What's Um, out there. Okay. And, uh, I'm thinking right now, but no, no, I don't think I've read any opening books. Okay. Um, but hopefully, you know, Team Magnus, you still got to have Jan from my perspective. So don't don't be discouraged by his lack of chess book reading. His uh, <laughs> his reputation speaks for itself. Um, so you mentioned comedians, Netflix, nonsense. What other uh, recommendations can you give us outside of chess, Jan? What, how should we be spending our um, our free time? 
I don't know. Do you have any free time? Sounds like you know, your I told you, yeah. is growing. I, you're adding another podcast. You're giving all these chess lessons. You have all these kids. Like, well, I try to avoid the chess lessons as best I can, but <laughs> but um, tell me about it. <laughs> but I do do some. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, my kids are reaching the age where like sometimes they play with each other. It's amazing. Yeah. I can actually sit there wow. like an like an adult. <laughs> it's it's, it's wonderful. Wait. Yeah, yeah, uh, you, it's something to look forward to. Um, so yeah, a little bit more time, but uh, yeah, we really um, got into Barry, the show, and of course, um, Succession. That's and of course, a couple comedy shows. Uh, what about you? What you got? I watched the first season of Succession. I enjoyed that, but. It might sound hard to believe. Uh, I also don't have that much time, so I haven't really caught up to the second season yet. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, I really like Succession. Yeah, we're on the same spot, actually. I mean, we won't talk about what's going to happen for the three other people in the same spot, but but yeah, that's where <laughs> we are. It's really really enjoyed it. Even though nowadays, should, do you think one should worry about spoiling stuff? Is there like a rule? Like one month after it's out, one can talk about it. Or what are the rules? I don't I'm know. always, I mean, you're the one with the good memory. I, when people talk about spoilers, I'm like, I can't even remember like what I had for breakfast. And people think I'm going to like remember some spoiler from some show I've never seen. Um, right, right, so, right. So I say fire away. Listeners, you can always skip ahead a minute or whatever. Yeah. Um, um, but, so what have, have I been watching? I don't know. I actually went to... To a Bill Burr stand-up comedy program. I traveled all the way to Oslo. To, yeah, to watch yeah. Bill Burr. You tweeted Big Bill that. Burr fan. I enjoy his comedy. I keep. I always fail at listening to his podcast. <laughs> I always. It yeah, always, I, I don't do it either. Yeah, it turns me off. Um, I mean, not. I'm not offended. I just get bored. Um, yeah, but he's pretty funny. Yeah. Speaking of comedians, podcasts. Though, I feel the other way around about Anthony Jeselnik. I get bored a little bit by his stand-up specials, even though they're impressively crafted. But yeah, he's more about joke structure. But I really enjoy his podcast. So what's called the Jason Nick and Rosenthal um, JRVP. Okay. Hot Vanity America. Project. Jason, Jason Nick and Rosenthal Vanity Project. Highly recommended. I really enjoy it. Okay. So listeners, when you're done with Perpetual Chess... <laughs> then, right, right, right. It's a natural fit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Forget about your adult improving for a moment. Find an hour for JRVP. Does he interview people, or is it one of these where they just riff? What's What's the format? No, no, no. He's just talking to a friend of his, and they have a producer who they make fun of, and there is no no real format. They okay. just I find that stuff. to be tough. Like you're you're a Neil Brennan fan as well, right? Sure. Sure. Because he's got a podcast too now. How Neil feel? Are you familiar? No, I haven't listened to his podcast. Yet. Okay, I but really it's also like a, it's like a riffing one, and I just find right. generally the uh, the hit ratio is always going to be smaller than a stand up act. Yeah, but it doesn't have to be like nonstop jokes, right? Like once you know what's going on in people's lives, you can become a bit of a stalker and you enjoy their their viewpoints and what where they get upset. Another yeah. one I've been listening to. No one will care about this. Another one I've enjoyed is Two Bears, One Cave, another two comedian podcast. Okay. Kurt Kreischer and Tom Segura. Also just riffing, but yeah. Basically, I feel I never have time to watch TV, but whenever I'm whatever on trains or airplanes or at the gym, I can get a lot of podcasts. And so that's my main means of, I don't know, getting information, killing time, whatever you want to call it. Joe okay. Rogan podcast, you listen to Joe Rogan. I, I've gotten into Joe Rogan. I'm a little late to the party, but if I'm interested in the topic, normally I can I enjoy those as well. Yeah, I mean, I pick and choose based on the guests. It's it's so long that, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that it's that it's tough, but I mean, it's compelling when it, when it's at its best. There's it's very good. Yeah, um, exactly. All right, Jan, we we're uh, we spent five minutes on podcast. That probably means we're almost done. That that can't be enough, right? We haven't covered movies yet, but. Oh and, yeah, I, I mean, think of that's, any that's, stand-up that's, movies. Yeah, do you I, go to the movies? Now that no, your kids I saw, are of course, of course, I saw Frozen too. But other than that, uh, so did I. So did I. Went oh, with my daughter. Yeah, had a great think? time. Yeah, it was fun. It was cute. I don't know. She enjoyed it, and yeah, it was cute. For me, it was like they put some complicated political layers on top of it, probably so that us educated adults couldn't draw ourselves. And I thought that's too complicated. I don't know enough about. Um. What was the story about? I'm going to 
get into a hot war I mean, here, was, but about quest, like quest giving movie. land back to. Um, and no, there was some underlying of maybe things that went wrong in the American past and how to fix it. No, and wow, that flew right over my head. I, ah, I, you, you didn't see that, yeah? You I was just like, oh, that's. Outside. I was like, that's cute. It has a plot. <laughs> Wow, you missed the whole reparations narrative. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to do some internet digging, though. But, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I was yeah, mainly... No, yeah, I also went to the movies to watch Frozen 2. That might, might have been the last time I was at the movie. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. enjoyed Parasite, South Korean movie. I'm very artsy. So watch Parasite if you haven't seen it. It's a really great movie. Okay. Um, all right. Plenty of recommendations. We know who's going to win the candidates now, or at least we've got it down to two. Uh, got some behind the scenes stuff. Um, the chessable course available now. Lifetime repertoires. Jan really has been playing this for his lifetime. So I think we got everything, Jan. I don't know. I feel once again I let the adult improvers down. <laughs> You're not even asking me anymore about like how to get from 1900 to 2100. <laughs> well, I did what I did know. <laughs> it wasn't lost on me. Oh, and by the way, I wanted to say the name of the person you played because I feel like, you know, we're talking about his game. The least we could do is say it. So let me see if I called it up and then lost it when I got got busy looking up flat white coffee. Do you remember the gentleman's name that you played in Bundesliga? <laughs> ah, here it is. Uh, Fatih Baltic. So shout out to there FM. You go. Shout Good out to player. FM. Not played much better than his rating. So shout out to him. But yeah, it wasn't lost on me that you said you hadn't even looked at the game afterwards. So I figured that was a cue that we probably shouldn't go too deep on improvement. Ah, uh, is that a thing one should do? We analyze one's games? Yeah. So I hear. Ah, who knew? Should I solve exercises without looking up the solution? <laughs> yes, you should, as, a, as it happens. I don't believe in that. I feel that's the myth spread by every coach. I don't know anybody who's doing that. I'd actually, but I have never asked you about studies. Were you a study person? Like, uh, nah. no? like I enjoy them if they're pretty. Like Jochen on he had some cool studies he used to show me, and yeah, I enjoy like trying to solve them. But do we have evidence that actually sitting down mm. and going through these two hundred exercises and really losing a lot of time trying to solve them yourself brings better results than whatever looking at the position, thinking something, then thinking, yeah, who knows. Then looking up the solution and then be upset. Oh, I missed that. You well, also store the pattern, right? Why is that worse? Yeah, and well, it's much like, more time efficient. It's like nutrition. No one, no one knows anything. You know, <laughs> so. I think no one knows anything. And I'm serious about this. There is always these three points that are always brought up: analyze your own games, solve studies without looking up the solution, and do we really know? Like, I don't think we really know. I think it's just yeah, being thrown out there. But where's the evidence? Yeah, I mean, you can certainly come up with anecdotal cases, but it would be very hard to do like a controlled study. Yeah, but I can come up with many anecdotal cases of super grandmasters I've talked to that have never done these things. Yeah, I enjoyed the anecdote in uh, in uh, the Anon Files where at one point they're consulting for um, opening advice and they, they said that they Skyped to Magnus and showed him some, I think it was a Queen's Gambit line, and he said it looked like crap and went back to playing video games. <laughs> was yeah, that no, that, that's an episode I buy 100%. <laughs> but uh, on a serious note, I think if you would ask Magnus, he would also say that, yeah, this solving exercise is not really his thing, but he very much believes in playing blitz scares, which, for example, the old guard would advise against if you're studying an opening. Go play some blitz games with it. And then if you want to, you can study those games. But what I'm saying is, I'm not so sure that the one formula that is being repeated and repeated and repeated is really the one formula. Having said that, my, my whole point is I don't have a clue. And yeah, sorry, I can't help it, <laughs> as usual. I just sometimes I get a bit annoyed when I see the 10,000th tweet about analyze your own games, <clears throat> those exercises, <clears throat> study the end game. Give me a break. Yeah, well... Um, I think the advice that, like, if you're bad at something, you should try to get better at it. You know, that seems logical to me. Like, some Not aspect of the game. Strengths and your strengths. Okay. <laughs> and in your case, of like course... basketball. Just use the players correctly or use your weapons correctly. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could, you could See, certainly... Porzinga make... stops posting up and boom, Dallas is doing well. 
Yeah. So last time I talked to you, you were more checked out than you used to be on the NBA. Is that still the case? I don't have much time. I do the usual. I listen to the podcast. I'm sure you're listening to as well. The oh. Low Post, Bill, Bill Simmon podcast, these things. You listening and to I the Holl- read the Ringer, ESPN, and so on. Hollinger and Duncan. The the John Hollinger. And Nate I listened Duncan. to Hollinger on Zach Lowe, but I didn't listen to the Duncan. No, it's a good try. Check it out. It's really good. It's the best. Once a week, uh, Sunday nights. Well, who knows what time? Oh, they have they have a podcast together. I used yeah. to listen to this dunk on once in a while, but not regularly. Yeah, but you mentioned you weren't a fan of. <laughs> we're really losing listeners now, <laughs> but but you mentioned you, <laughs> okay. you yeah you weren't a fan of the co-host. Um, but uh, Hollinger right. and Hollinger and Duncan is like my new favorite basketball podcast. Uh, no thanks. I'll check it out. Okay, and report back um, next year. There's still no other chess podcast other than Perpetual Chess, right? Uh, I mean the U.S. Chess. Shout out to U.S. Chess. They put out a different one every week. But yeah, that's uh, that's about it. Boom! Amazing. After all these years, you're still cornering the market. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> anyway, right, man. congratulations on the growth. Thanks for having me on the show. And yeah, sorry for not saying anything valuable as usual. Okay, well, we'll look forward to the weekend's e-coverage and check out the chessable course and all that stuff. Thank you, as always, Jan. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Most of all to my producer, Matthew Passy, but also to everyone who helps spread the word about the show, whether via word of mouth, positive reviews on Apple Podcasts or other platforms. All of that stuff helps more people find out about the show. But most of all, I want to thank the people who support the show financially. You guys have enabled me to continuously work to improve and now expand the Perpetual Chess podcast offering. So for that, I am forever grateful. I would like to give thanks to the following people and entities. Special thanks to Chessable.com, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, Apprentice's Twitch channel, Andrew Bach, Austin Clef, Benjamin Porto, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, Dan O'Hanlon, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Greg Natel, I am Greg Shahadi, Guven Manet, Jens Green, John Jernigan, John Cromarty, Kelly Palmer, Lone Pine Chess, Lorraine Dore, Lucio Casada Silva, the law offices of Stuart Katz, Michael Kahn, Mike Zelazny, Moonmaster 9000, where you've been hiding, Moonmaster, you haven't asked a question in a while. Reuven Fisher, Seattle Chess Club, Thomas Stonix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryan of Strong Chess, Todd Kennedy, and I would also like to give thanks to the following people and entities. Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Terakov, Andrew Perry, BetterChessTraining.com, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Chris Balcom, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Courtney Fry, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Lucas of U.S. Chess, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Cramley, Dade Lynn Shelton, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith. I am elect Donnie Ariel, or possibly not I am elect. Either way, Donnie Ariel, Fox Valley Chess Club, Frank Tortoris, MD, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt of Chessable, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Han Shu, Harish Srinivasan, James Bonastia, Jason Anfang, Jason Woolham, Jeffrey Martello, Jerry Wells, J.J. Stranod, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John McMurtry, Jordan Goodwin, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Larry Ryforth, Laura Belyavsky, Martin Knudsen, Matthew Passy. Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Miguel Araspide, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paula Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Peter Sodi, Randy Temple, Ricky Grahava, Roy Yearwood, Ryan Berg, 
the Say Chess YouTube channel, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwater, WGM, Tatya Vabrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyrin Price, Victor Vrancouz, Wayne Beam, William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Chang of Chess1000.com, and last but never least, Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks, everyone. I will catch you guys next week.